Cocktail Sessions, educational and inspirational talks from experienced startup founders, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders. All right, I have my hands waving. I'm going to get activated here. Um, I want to thank Frank. Actually, interesting side note on Frank, and I don't even think he knows this, so this is to put him on the spot. One of my first interviews when we started the company uh, and brought it down to Virginia was with Frank when he was starting Tech Cocktail. And I'm pretty sure we both didn't know who the hell the other person was. Um, so it was pretty interesting. And uh, that afternoon, actually, just to show you what a gangster Frank is in the company, kept. I was talking to another blogger by the name of Pete Cashmore, who now runs Mashable, yeah. and he used to blog. So that's that's how old we are in this space. So um, sorry about that. So anyway, um, I want to thank Frank for uh, the opportunity to speak here. I'm really excited to be here. And in fact, it's interesting to be in a Capital One Labs building because one of our old and early investors was one of the co-founders of Capital One, <coughs> Nigel Morris. Um, so he's a big proponent of the data-driven enterprise. But also, one of the big things that he spoke to us about and I learned from him was that as important as it is to manage against metrics and build a data-driven enterprise, it's as important, if not more so, to manage the people and talk about culture. So what I wanted to talk about briefly today was something softer, something more fundamental, which is lessons that we had in terms of culture. And uh, hopefully it's useful to you. And then I wanted to open up a little bit to Q&A and you know, throw some hard stuff at me. Hopefully uh, it's late and I'm tired, so you can probably throw me off to the side. Um, anyway, so how many people here run a company? Oh, a lot. How many people here work for a startup? Okay. And how many people want to work for a startup? Okay, so pretty much 100% of the room is in and around startups. Um, so hopefully this is very pertinent. So one of the core things that you learn when you're kind of on the business school side of things and coming from um, the corporate world is the CEO's job is to maximize shareholder value. It's a really amorphous corporate kind of like non-fun thing to hear. And how do you do that as a CEO? So you have a number of different tools, but at the end of the day, your job is really about alignment. So what does that mean? First and foremost, you have to set a vision, right? We've all seen these very amorphous vision statements, but I'm a big fan, uh, especially after doing this for a couple of years, of vision statements with numbers. So for example, one of the companies that I'm on the board of um, that's done a really good job of this is Always Prep. So they're an education technology company and they're based actually in this area. And their vision is basically very simple. And it's to become the data analytics platform that's gonna connect the seven million teachers to the 55 million parents, to the 100 million students, and all the administrators, and basically enable personalized learning. So they have four different product lines they're gonna build over time, one of which is, for example, okay. Uh, one of which, for example, their flagship product is really about teachers and moving away from a grade book to analytics. So the idea being is as teachers are going to use applications more and more, uh, instead of them actually writing things down by hand, why don't we just pull out the data from APIs and they have a real-time assessment of how the student's doing over time. And then you can use that back when you start delivering, moving from report cards into real-time analytics for parents. So instead of, you know, hey, I'm a parent and I see my high school student, you know, eight times a year I kind of get a checkpoint, I can do it in real time all the time. And so I'm really passionate about that. Um, but to go ahead and, you know, riff on that, they have that vision. And then you take the vision and you break a strategy. So Alexis had a really great talk about strategy and everything else. Strategy then goes to plan, plan goes to metrics that you checkpoint the plan on, and you have process and work, right? So you literally just have, your job is to figure out the fastest way to, to align those five components, if you will, of uh, the management. But the thing that's common between those things, and as your company scales, um, you know, we're upwards of 130, 140 people at this point, is people, right? So you can't be in Chicago hanging out with a Ford client, or you can't be uh, an account rep when someone calls and says, hey, Ad, this is breaking my 100 sites. So how, how do you make sure that people are aligned? And at the end of the day, that's culture. And culture really, to me, is it's going to determine how people interact, not only in your company, but with your customers and with your investments. So it's almost the language in which the story of your company is written. So it's critical. Um, and I can't tell you how many times that I, I beat this down. In fact, one of the guys who's working with Tech Cocktail, uh, Justin Thorpe, was one of the guys I worked a lot with on this culture, um, reading books and what have you. And he was representing us out to the world. And it forced a lot of changes to have the right culture. So um, I want to talk to you first about what culture is not. And so what culture is not 
uh, in my opinion, is one person. So there's often this mistake, in particular, um, I feel like an old guy, I go to the Valley and, you know, looking at companies to angel invest or advise, and you find these programmers. So do you guys know what a programmer is? You guys read about it? So for, for those of you guys that don't know what a programmer is, and I used to be one, so I'm not making fun, um, it's a programmer who's also one of the bros. So it's like, think of this like Luton hybrid between a programmer and a frat guy. It's kind of terrifying. So when we started out the company, I think, uh, especially when we moved here, um, my co-founder Austin, I think we moved here in 2006, and uh, him and I maybe were programmers. So, you know, let's make sure we're in the gym, let's make sure we're working all night, um, you know, strong work ethic, work ethic, but we joke a lot, you know, good people, but everyone started looking the same. So the first people we hired, you know, guys out of Carnegie Mellon that went with us, and what have you, looked very similar to us. And when you look at the first, you know, a couple people in the company, you know, we were all working really hard and aligned, and, but at the same time, it was very homogeneous, right? 25-year-old developer, hardcore, right? And we were thinking to ourselves, man, we never want to get anyone else who looks like us. So I'm going to pick on someone who's in the audience here, and he didn't know I was going to do this, but um, a guy named Steve Tuhill. So Steve is right there. You can point at him. Wave. Okay, so Steve uh, worked with us. Uh, and was one of the early guys and uh, taught me a lot personally. He's been a great friend and mentor. Um, but Steve comes on here and he walks in wearing, you know, khakis and pleated pants. I mean, I didn't know what that was. Like my jeans had rips in them and what have you. And he talked about making money and oh, what are, what's going on here? So, uh, but one of the things that I learned from him was that um, how does the media business work, right? What do the online web publishers want? Um, when you look at at this today, and what it's become a lot of that is because of the ideas, the challenges, and the lessons that came from people who are early who are different than us. Right? And so, um, for example, one of the things I'll tell you is we probably wouldn't have figured out an engagement model and how to go up and talk to the big guys like NBC Universal and these larger publishers. We wouldn't even consider them had we not gone out there. And we wouldn't have tried different business models that eventually got us to the point where we were. Um, and we interact with, at this point, you know, to Frank's uh, point, 14 million publishers and reach 1.3 billion unique users every month. And I think last year we processed a trillion page views, right? And so what scaled that is culture. And I really believe that. In fact, I think one of their investors is one of the most excellent visionaries in this field. So if you haven't checked out Tony Shea's stuff, I would check it out. He's doing the downtown project. But um, he wrote these amazing you know, articles, books. He's been a proponent of this whole thing. And the fundamentals of these great companies, if you look at Google, you look at Zappos, it's always that. And so, it's really interesting to see, and the key lesson that I had there was, it's not about one person, right? And so then there's a, this dichotomy, right? So you want to have this diversity of thought, right? You want to have different people, and you want to build skilled organizations. So it doesn't matter, you know, age shouldn't matter. And again, I'll be honest with you, we were very much factoring on age when we started having older people, you know, in the company. People were afraid, you know, oh man, we're going to become stiff and what have you. Um, when we started going in terms of salespeople, oh, well, we're not going to care about the platform and things like that. These are tough issues, but I think what you need to remember is that when you look at innovation, and innovation is the way you create shareholder value, um, innovation comes from diversity of thought. It's about getting a guy who has this idea and he says, well, look, at the end of the day, we need to make money. Here are the three ways, and this is what I know. And a developer who says, look, this is the tools and technology, this is what I know, and this is where things are going, and trying to find that intersection between the two of them, because that's where you can kind of jump the gun, disrupt the people who aren't willing to talk to one another. And so one of the big paradoxes that you'll see here is I'm talking a lot about two different things, having one culture, but having a bunch of different people. And so the way that you can align that is very simple. Uh, as a manager, it's about principles, not people. And so I'll just give you a couple principles that we found and that when I look at great companies, public, small, partners, and what have you, I've seen very common. So um, one of the first things that I've seen is that great companies, it's really A or out, right? So when you're looking at your team, and this is iterative, so it's not an absolute standard, it's something that you're gonna write over time, you wanna have A players, right? So it's, there's this famous thing like A's hire B's, B's hire C's, and so on and so forth. So you wanna make sure that you're always trying to build the best people and iterate on what standards of excellence are. So that's number one. I think number two, when you're looking at a good cultural pillar, it's about always improving. So what that means when you want to always improve is that you're willing to take a hard look at everything you're doing with a critical eye, be intellectually honest, and say, look, this is what we learned, 
this is what we did, and this is how we're going to change it. And sometimes that means, no, inevitably that means somebody is wrong, and you've got to take emotion out of the equation, because that's how companies get good fast. Um, one of the things I learned from Nigel Morris, for example, who was the guy who's founder of Capital One, is if you remove emotion and actually have a fail-fest mentality and actually embrace the failure, it actually becomes a fun game. So for example, when we were growing, uh, at first, a lot of it was we did some viral hacks and we had some smart intuition. But you know, when we got from zero to 600 million unique users, um, a lot of that was intuitive and, and a lot of hard work. And we used numbers, but the 600 to 1.3 was tough. Um, and a lot of that was A-B testing before optimizing and things came out. We had to hack our own stuff. So it was really challenging. And I'll tell you, the way that we did that was you take emotion out of the equation and you're, you're focused on actually results. So we have, used to have arguments and say, hey, well, this shouldn't be this color. This button should be this thing. And how many of you guys have had these kind of like, hey, look at these mock-ups. I think this is better. I think this is. Well, the amount of time that you spend talking about that, you could have built two versions of the site and A-B did. Right? And so once we got people to start to embrace that, that mentality, and then it was about looking at the result, we wanted to rush to see what the test came out. And Marty, uh, who's back there, has done more testing with me on more failed concepts than anyone probably ever. You work too. Some work, yeah, a couple work. And you only need one or two, actually, to work really well. Um, and so I think that's important. But you, ha you have to have that and, and embrace that, and it's tough. The third piece that um, we learned was to have fun along the way. And I, I'll actually tell you something funny. I had more fun at, towards the end, in some ways, than I did at the beginning. And I'll talk about the right fun. So it's not just about you know, giving out free t-shirts and partying and all that stuff and getting mentioned in tech press and everything. It's about celebrating successes. right? So when you come up with a plan, when you come up with a vision, and every time there's a milestone achievement, whether it's hitting a unique user reach or hitting revenue, if people can celebrate along the way, you can transform something which has to be a marathon by definition if you're trying to build a half a billion or billion dollar company into a marathon, right? Where it's fun, it's something we look forward to, there's always new challenges. People can sprint in a startup for you know a year or two, but you will burn right through them. And one of the ways you burn through them is that it's never good enough. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, they mistake celebrating their successes for something. It's like, oh man, we're being complacent, we're too happy. You have to actually build that into the culture very early on. And I think we did a better job of that later on, learning the hard lessons um, than we did early on. And so the last thing that I'll tell you, and it's, it's kind of a common theme here, is that you have to have people first, right? And so when I think about people first, it's not just about um, your customers. Right, and keeping them top of mind and making sure employees are top of mind. But it's about alignment across the three constituents. So you have your customers, you have your employees, and you have your investors. And oftentimes when you look at culture, there's a lot of work and discussion about making sure that people within the company have the same culture. But I'll tell you from experience, and I think a lot of folks will tell you, culture is something that is in your brand. I mean, Zappos, for example, their brand is all about that. It's become embedded, and remember, that if those three groups are not aligned, you can't have success. So for example, you can have the best co corporate culture in the world. And for those of you guys that have bigger companies and will have bigger companies, inevitably the board impacts culture, right? So if they're constantly talking about things which are not the same as the company, that's going to affect the CEO and management team. And uh, there's, there's a lot, you know, a lot of people will talk about this and say, well, the CEO insulates them from the board and what have you. That's absolutely not true, right? So if the CEO's priorities are driven into a direction which is opposing to the board, then that starts trickling down, trickling down, trickling down. So when you're going to found a company from the very beginning, if you keep in mind, just, just at a high level, that you want to make sure that, that that's the way you're going to pick your next investor, you know, that's the way you're going to pick your partner, I think that you're going to be better served.